بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our Imam, please recite the salawat. For his health and well-being, recite the second one louder. Inshallah, each and every one of us becomes a true companion and soldier of our beloved Imam. Recite the third one even louder. Over the course of these nights, we've tried to discuss something which we feel is very relevant to the season and to each of and every one of us today. As Shia of Amirul Mu'mineen, Shia of the Ahlul Bayt, we have got to try to explore more the idea of what Shia means. We made use of the slogan, Ya La Tharat Al Hussein, to say that we are supposed to be, as we were in history, the party of the Ahlul Bayt. The party of the Ahlul Bayt means a group of people that have come together with a common objective. And this group of people working together towards the common objective are going to have friends which are those who will be with them in that party and they will have those who are going to be working against them enemies it's important that we understand this mentality being the party of the Ahlul Bayt what the common objective is, who our friends are, who the people that we can work with are, and who the people that are working against us are. And we explained in the first session how that's very important. I don't want to repeat, but just a brief explanation to know what we're discussing, especially for those who've come in new. In order to understand this better, in this season we want to talk about, as the slogan put it, the movement of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Salamullah alayhi. We want to understand what the Imam did, why what happened to him happened at that time. And in order to understand that whole picture fully, we started with the Holy Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. We carried on over to Amirul Mu'mineen. We're following the sequence of events. We talked about Amirul Mu'mineen and we said that we can divide the history of this beloved Imam into three major categories. One is the first few days or months after the demise of the Holy Prophet. The event of the Khilafah, what happened at Saqifa and afterwards. That is a very, very important piece of history. We very briefly went through that which we will continue tonight. And then after that, we're going to be talking about 
the rest of the 25 years that Amir al-Mu'mineen did not have government during the time of the three Khulafa. What did Amir al-Mu'mineen do? What happened? How he dealt with the circumstances? And then we have the close to five years of the government of the Imam. The chain of events will help us understand what's going to come after, inshallah. When we talked about Saqifa, we talked about the main enemy that caused what happened in Saqifa to occur out of the enemies that the Holy Prophet had as he has stated the one that caused the event of Saqifa was the inner enemy that every single one of us has the nafs Hawa'un nafs if the soul is not trained if we don't control the desires, even if we have been with the most sacred and the holiest person on the face of the globe and the holiest creature from beginning of time all the way to the end, we will still, God forbid, end up making such a huge mistake that they did at Saqifa. The problem was nafs. People wanted to rule people like money, they wanted influence, desires. Others were silent because of desires. We explained that. What we didn't explain is another element which is also important to understand, but I'll explain that in explaining the friends of Amirul Mu'mineen. Who were those that joined Amir al Mu'mineen? There were a few of Bani Hashim, like the uncle of the Holy Prophet Abbas and his son Fadl ibn Abbas, and probably others, and also some women, which we know the daughter of the Holy Prophet is on top of the list. But out of the others, the companions that were not related to Amir al-Mu'mineen and that had no role in their decision to join the Imam, who joined the Imam? There are only a few people and the sincere ones, we can say according to some ahadith, as I said, there were more than this, all right, but according to some hadith, Three are mentioned to be the most important friends of Amir al-Mu'mineen. One is Salman al-Farsi. The other is Miqdad al-Aswad. And third is Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. These three individuals are those that were with the Imam. From there and all the way to the end of their lives, they were with Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi. What caused these individuals to be the friends of Amir al Mu'mineen? One of the elements that caused them to be the friends of Amir al Mu'mineen is something we've already talked about the opposite of Hawa un Nafs, which is the purity of the soul and the Nafs, the control over the soul and the Nafs. Salman al Farsi. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, Miqdad al-Aswad, throughout the history when they were with the Holy Prophet, they were always trying to purify themselves and do as the Holy Prophet said. Always. When we look at the history of the Holy Prophet and we see these three individuals, they stand out, out of the non-ma'asumin. Obviously, Amir al muminin no one can be compared to him. Out of the non masumi these three individuals stand out. You may have heard this story. They say one day the Holy Prophet told his companions that tomorrow morning I'll be going out to a certain location and we will have a session. Those who like to join, come along. Now, it was apparently an early event. Not everybody was really wanting to go Salman says 
he got up to go in that morning that he was supposed to. And when he started on his path going towards where the Holy Prophet had said to everyone he will go to, he saw that there was only one set of footprints. Salman feels very good. He thinks to himself, I'm the first one to join the Holy Prophet. I'll be alone with the Holy Prophet. I will be the one who is stepping, in a sense, in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet. I'm coming right after him. So he got really happy. But it says, when he arrived there with the Holy Prophet, he saw Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullah alayhi is there as well. And so he asked, he said, Ya Ali, I only saw one set of footprints while I was coming. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, look, I follow the Holy Prophet in everything he does. I put my feet where the feet of the Holy Prophet were. Okay. Even in where I put my feet, I copy the Holy Prophet. Amir al-Mu'mineen made this a point. Something as simple as that, how important is it to foot, uh, set foot in the footprints of the Holy Prophet? Does it really make that much of a difference? Amir al wants to be that similar to the Holy Prophet. It teaches all of us a lesson. Now this is the fadila of Amir al but I want to focus on the other individual, Salman. Other than Amir al after the Ma'asum, the first person to join the Holy Prophet is Salman. In a number of instances during the time of the Holy Prophet, we see Salman, after Amir al muminin is able to receive the blessings of prophethood by going to the Holy Prophet, implementing those teachings to the extent that even between these three individuals, it is said that if, if Abu Dhar was aware of what Salman is thinking, the type of information Salman has, what Salman believes in, Abu Dhar would have killed Salman. This is how Salman is. Abu Dhar was also someone who was loving of the Holy Prophet. He loved the Holy Prophet. He tried his best to do whatever the Holy Prophet said. That's found in that history. For Miqdad, one instance I'll mention. The instance of the Battle of Badr was a difficult one. The battle of Badr was the first battle that the believers fought. When they set out, when they left Medina, they were not planning on fighting a battle with an army that is prepared for battle. They had left the city to go and confiscate the caravan that was going from Mecca to Sham for business. They had taken a lot of the belongings of the believers. The Holy Prophet went out to take some of that back from this caravan. They hadn't gone out to deal with an army prepared to fight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that story in the Holy Quran. He says the believers thought that they're going to get that caravan, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to fight the army that had come out. So when they were told, the Holy Prophet was told to speak to the people and see if they're willing to fight. When he asked the people if they were willing to fight, out of the muhajirin, because you have the Ansar and you have the muhajirin. The Ansar, as we mentioned before, they were always with the Holy Prophet. They, in this instance as well, they showed their loyalty when it came their turn to speak. They said, we have pledged allegiance to give whatever we have for you, our lives before your life. And therefore we will fight. But out of the muhajireen, some individuals which will, I will not name, were the first ones to stand up and say, Oh Prophet, we didn't come out here for this. We're not ready for this. Let's go back to Medina. One after the other, they stood up and said that. Miqdad out of the muhajireen was the one who stood up and said, Oh Prophet, everything we have is yours. And we're going to fa fight to the last breath. They had trained themselves. This is one element within them. Amir al muminin explains to us in a very beautiful statement which is found in both Nahjul Balagha and also in Al-Kafi in the Usul section 
of Al-Kafi, this hadith has been narrated. Amirul Mu'mineen explains to us, there are two elements necessary for believers to be able to make it through such a difficult test. One of them is faith. One of them is practice. One of them is training the soul. But the other one is awareness. The other one is understanding. Understanding the deen, understanding Islam, and understanding the context which we are in. This is very important. Let me explain it in the context that we're trying to discuss. As we mentioned, the people who set up Saqifa are actually the Ansar. Put that into perspective. The Ansar which we just mentioned were so loyal to the Holy Prophet, they set up Saqifa. They said, we need to appoint our own ruler. After that, the first two Khalifas along with Abu Ubaidah came over and you know what happened, they pledged allegiance with Abu Bakr. Otherwise, initially, the Ansar set up Saqifa. And later on, we do have traditions on this, we do have narrations on this, we do have historic accounts of this. The Ansar regretted this decision of theirs to set up Saqifa like no other decision. They regretted it shortly after. Now we can see the other element in the enemies or the problem. What created the problem for Amir al Mu'minin was this lack of understanding. The friends of Amir al Mu'minin had two elements. There were tazkiyatun nafs, the purity of the soul, training the nafs, avoiding sin, purifying the soul, going against desires, and knowledge, understanding. Properly understanding the matter. The ones who created the problem had lacking in both of those areas. One was the purity of the soul. The other one was not understanding fully what is going on. The problem that the Ansar had, yes, they were a little weak on the faith side. They had some weaknesses, but they were not great sinners. Some of the others maybe who were involved with this were not constant sinners. They suffered from the second element there. And that is the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa in Ghadir announced very clearly that the person that will lead after the Holy Prophet is Amir al -Mumineen. He made that very clear. There's no question. I've heard some people have questioned whether that was made clear and mentioned explicitly yes it was mentioned absolutely explicitly there was no implicitness in that it was very clear but what happened the Ansar didn't understand the importance of this it has to do with the knowledge of the deen sometimes there's something which is mentioned in religion brothers and sisters but because we have a misunderstanding of that, we don't consider it too important. Okay? This is a problem. Our communities suffer today from this problem. There are certain teachings of Islam that we're not even aware of. Some of those which we are aware of, we don't understand their importance. This is what the Ansar were suffering from, partially. The religion part of it. They didn't understand how important it is that when the Holy Prophet said, it is Ali, then it is Ali, period. They didn't understand that. Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, they did understand that. The other thing which they didn't understand, which is also 
something that I hope the communities, we, brothers and sisters, are able to develop within ourselves, is understanding the circumstances. If you and I would have been there, even having heard, because when you look at that history, it's a very complicated part of history. When you look at that history, you'll find people that were fully aware of also the importance of having Amirul Mu'mineen as the leader. The Holy Prophet said it. You can't go against the word of the Holy Prophet. They realize that. But they thought, okay, these people are saying we've pledged allegiance with Abu Bakr and others have joined them as well. I know the Holy Prophet said it, but does it really make that big of a difference? One thing, as we said, is understanding when it comes from the source, when it comes from wahi, when it comes from revelation, just because it comes from revelation, we've got to take it serious. Okay. But the other thing is understanding that if you don't take that sometimes, if you don't take that serious, if you don't stand up, if you don't do something about it at that point in time, the aftermath of it is something that you cannot control. You have to speak at the right time. You have to stand at the right time. This is what I'm trying to get to. If you understand the, the circumstances, you can't say, well, let's try this today. Let's remain silent today. They're doing something absolutely wrong. They're talking about something which is absolutely wrong. And you're like, okay, let's, let's let this go by and then we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do later. You have to understand when you can do that and when you're not supposed to do that. I'll use the example of the Ansar again. The Ansar, after they pledged allegiance, the majority of them, except for a very few, after they pledged allegiance with Abu Bakr, you've heard of the story of Fadak. After Fadak was taken from the lady Fatima to Zahra, Salamullah alayha, which is a political move. They wanted to take that away because they felt that the amount of wealth that this will give the family of Amirul Mu'mineen is sufficient to take all the people away from these individuals and let them go and follow Amirul Mu'mineen. It was a political move to take that away from the lady Fatima to Zahra. Now, when they did that, she went and delivered a very powerful, an eloquent, an informative speech in the masjid known as Al-Khutbah al fadakiya It's a very important one to study. She made almost the masjid start to shake. Okay. Not just the people that were in it. That's how powerful it was. And he, she addressed the Ansar and the Muhajireen. After that session, the Ansar went to the lady Fatima to Zahra and said, First, at that point, they said to her, if Ali would have stood up, we would have all supported him. But what can we do? We've already pledged allegiance here. They said that there. Then time started going by, and then they started realizing how terrible what they did was. They started gathering together and thinking of what their mistake was and what to do and what not to do. It's a long story. What they realize in the end is that it's too late. It's too late. Brothers and sisters, we have to know what's going on in the world. As I said, we need to understand Islam, number one. Understand what are the most important things, what takes priority. Sometimes we miss out on these priorities, brothers and sisters, in Islam. La'an, for example, is something which is found in our dua. It is found in the Holy Quran. There's no question about it. 
However, the way you are going to say it, the context you are going to be doing it in, is misunderstood. Sometimes we give this preference over what Amirul Mu'mineen gave preference to. The unity of the Ummah. The unity of the Ummah, which one? Okay, is, is there even such a thing called unity of the Ummah? Some people even have a question on that. Is there such a thing? Some people bash that idea altogether. What is the unity? How can you sit on a table that someone who is not willing to accept that Yazid is a sinner, Yazid is a taghut, they're not willing to accept that, then how can we sit on the same table? Some people have this mentality. I hope we get and we understand this from the conduct of Amirul Mu'mineen, as we will briefly try to state. Unity is very important, extremely important. La'an is there, unity is there. Which one takes preference? Amirul Mu'mineen says unity. We have to understand, where do we get this? Study Islam. You don't want to take it from me? Okay, go study Islam. Don't just say, I think this and I think that. Or do you receive revelation? If we didn't need revelation, then why are we reading the Quran? Why do we refer to the Ahlul Bayt? We need to go to them. They need to tell us. So this is a second element for the people who created the problem, the lack of information, both from the Islamic perspective and understanding Islam, and secondly, understanding the context which they are in. It's important to understand that. The friends of Amir al-Mu'mineen, we explained, they had both of these, and it's very important to understand that. Let me give another example of that. There is between these three individuals that I mentioned, we have hadith. All right, this is a difficult hadith that I want to mention. I hope you guys don't don't mind me mentioning this hadith. One of my friends call these calls these a hadith scary a hadith. Sometimes people have an issue with, with hearing these ahadith. Amongst these three individuals, Miqdad, Salman, and Abu Dhar, we have hadith that apparently, if I remember correctly, it is Miqdad that had zero doubt with regards to Amir al -Mu'mini. But even Salman had some level of doubt. Where? This is understanding the circumstances, okay? Understanding the circumstances. The first part of understanding the circumstances was there. <clears throat> they realized how important the concept of wilaya and khilafah is. They supported Amirul Mu'mineen, okay? That is understood. But then the problem was the rest of the people are not supporting it. What do you do then? This is a problem in our communities as well. When you realize you study Islam, this is what we need to do, and you go and speak to people, they're not able to see it. They're not able to understand. What do you do then? Do you say we're going to fight to death? Do you go and argue? Do you leave the community? Do you go set up a new masjid? What do you do? If you're 100% sure that Islam has a particular teaching which is extremely important and the others in the community are not understanding that, what do you do there? This is where the issue becomes difficult. It says Salman had doubt in Amirul Mu'mineen when Amirul Mu'mineen, according to his own words, which I will read, said that he's not going to take a stance against this. He's going to remain silent. When Salman saw that, just imagine the picture of, you know, they're coming and asking Amirul Mu'mineen for allegiance. 
In Amir al-Mumin is silent. Salman is there. He's witnessing this scene. He has doubt in his mind. You know what his doubt is? That's a complicated one as well. It's pretty interesting. I find it at least. He thinks to himself, why isn't Ali, this is according to hadith, I'm not making this up, why isn't Ali using his supernatural powers? He can, if Ali ibn Abi Talib wants, he doesn't even have to use his sword. He doesn't. Okay. Without even using the sword, he can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this whole scene is going to change. Salman is thinking at that level. That's his thought process at that time. Why? This is so important. There should be something done about it. If it can't be done naturally because nobody's supporting, why isn't he using supernatural powers? The only person they say that didn't doubt at all, if I remember, it's either Abu Dhar or Mi'ghdad. I think it's Mi'ghdad from what I can remember. He had zero doubt. Nothing. When Amir al-Mu'maneen stood up and said, support me, he went for support. When Amir al-Mu'maneen said, we're going to remain silent, he didn't question anything, even in his mind. No question. Amir al-Mu'maneen says, we're not. We're not. I don't care why, but the Imam is saying, we are going to remain quiet. Understanding that is important. Recite a salawat, please. During the 25 years that Amir al Mu'mineen didn't have government after this incident, the way the Imam dealt with the Khulafa is important for us to understand. It's very important for us to understand the way Amir al Mu'mineen dealt with the Khulafa. We have to take lessons from that for ourselves. For today. It may not be a particular situation today, right now, that we are dealing with, but it's important to understand it because they do come up, not to the same extent that it was then, but they do come up. We do have these issues coming up now and then. How did the Imam deal with the Khulafa? One understanding that some of us have with regards to the Khulafa and the way Amir al-Mu'mineen would probably treat them is that these guys are kuffar. These guys are no longer Muslim. How do you deal with non-Muslims the same way that they were dealt with during the time of the Holy Prophet? There's a particular way that the Holy Prophet dealt with the kuffar. So if these guys are kuffar, then Amir al-Mu'mineen should be treating them as kuffar. Let's see, did Amir al-Mu'mineen treat them as kuffar? That's one assumption that is made. Another one which is understood, which is somewhat partial, there is some truth to it, but it's not the full truth, is silence for 25 years. What does that translate to? Amir al-Mu'mineen not participating in government at all, period. He's not part of anything. He's bitter and sour at these people for what they have done. He hasn't gotten his right. And therefore, he's going to just not take part in anything. Let's look at the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen and see what he has described his relationship as. I will quote first khutbah number or the sermon number 74 of Nahjul Balagha. He says in this sermon, he says, لَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ أَنِّي أَحَقُّ النَّاسِ بِهَا مِنْ غَيْرِ You all know, he's addressing the people, you all know that I am the most rightful person for this position. Everyone knows. وَوَاللَّهِ لَأُسْلِمَنَّ مَا سَلِمَتْ أُمُورُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ This is the partial part of it. I will, he swears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I will be peaceful. I will not take to my sword 
As long as the affairs of the Muslims is progressing and they are not touched. In other words, I am worried about the believers. I am worried about Muslimin. I'm not worried about myself, which is very important. We'll get to this a little further. And there's only oppression against me. If it's only against me, I will remain silent. This is one thing. However, this is not the only thing that is mentioned. We have another piece from the Imam, which is not a sermon, it is a letter. We find it in two sources. One of them is Nahjul Balagha. It is letter number 64. It is also found... Uh, the more extended version of it, the full version of it, in a book called Al Gharat, volume 1, page 204, in one of the prints. There's a number of prints. The print that I was looking at, it's page 204 of volume 1. Amir al Mu'manin says something which is very important for us to understand. I'm, I've just selected a passage. He says, فَأَمْسَكْتُ yadi." I didn't do anything. Initially, when Saqifah occurred, they pledged allegiance with Abu Bakr. The Imam remained completely silent. He didn't have to do, he, he had nothing to do with anything. He just didn't participate. He was at home. That's the partial part. But it's only for a short period of time. He says, Hatta ra'aytu raja'atan nas qad raja'at. Until I saw those of the people who started turning away. What happened after the Holy Prophet was that a number of people, even during the time of the Holy Prophet, let me mention this, there were a few individuals that started to claim that they're prophets. A few of them. During the time of the Holy Prophet, two or three. And you had some of the Muslims that started following these false prophets. The Holy Prophet dealt with them. It didn't end at that time. When the Holy Prophet passed away, more of that started occurring for various reasons. There was another individual who claimed prophethood. Then also there were some who realized, okay, we became Muslim because the Holy Prophet was there. Because the Holy Prophet fought us. Now that he's gone, we're going to go back to our old ways. You had this problem, apostasy. A number of people, tribes, started to leave Islam and it became very, very unstable. So you have, let's again see the full picture, you have empires that are hearing that there's a power created in this part of the world and they're feeling threatened because the Holy Prophet fought even the Romans up north. He sent letters to all the emperors. So they're worried about this new power that is emerging in the region. On the other hand, within the region which was controlled by the Holy Prophet, when the Holy Prophet left, then these people start turning away from the Holy Prophet and his path. Tribes, not individuals, tribes start to split off. Now this becomes very dangerous. All of what the Holy Prophet worked for is now in danger. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, when I saw this, I couldn't remain silent anymore. I went, he says this, and I joined and I helped where the decisions which were made were correct decisions made, I participated with them. This is important to understand. I'll just mention one example today that we don't do this, brothers and sisters. Sometimes when Again, I'll use that example of, of division because division is a huge problem in our communities. Every now and then, you have offshoots, communities split okay. for wrong reasons. And beyond splitting, the masajid that we have, the centers that we have, we're not able to come together and work together, be that party of Amirul Mu'mineen. We have a lot of shayateen. But other than the shayateen, 
The problem that probably exists within myself as well, and I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps me relieve myself of this, or He relieves me of this problem, is that I see myself as haq. I see what I do as right. And I see what others do as wrong. A lot of times this is actually wrong, right? A lot of times. A lot of times I'm not 100% right, they're not 100% wrong. It's somewhat, I'm maybe, maybe I'm correct to a certain extent. And they probably have something right about what they're saying as well. Right. But let's assume, let's assume somehow I know for a fact I am 100% right and the other people are 100% wrong. Amir al-Mu'mineen teaches us that for this, if you're working for the sake of the ummah, it's not for you, it's not that I want to be this, it's not that I want to be that. Even if I'm 100% right, I'm going to have to work with others that don't understand what I'm saying. For the sake of the ummah. There is no one on the face of the earth that can say I'm 100% right like Amir al muminin is. As the Holy Prophet said, Aliyun ma'al haq wal haqqum ma'a Ali. Yaduru haythu dar. Haq is wherever Ali is. Ever wonder where haq is, where the truth is, where the right is? You gotta follow Ali. Ali who is the one who draws the line between right and wrong, because it's not about him, it's not about nafs, it's about the ummah, he's able to work with people who have clearly, for the wrong reasons, taken his right. He's able to work with them. We can't do that. We've got to learn this lesson from Amir al mumini He says, at this point, I joined, I helped out. So how did Amir al muminin deal with them? Are they deal, dealt with as kuffar? No, they're not dealt with as kuffar. They're dealt with as believers that are weak. And he joined them wherever their decisions were right. Now, let's go over the 25 years and see the problems and the enemies of Amir al muminin after the point of Saqifa. We talked about this, uh, the Khulafa themselves to a certain extent. I will call them, and the problem with the Khulafa and the people who support them, the problem of Hawa'un Nafs. We mentioned this the other night as well. The problem of Hawa'un Nafs. The enemy of the self within, which is within all believers. But there's another enemy during this time that we cannot neglect. And this is important to see the trend and see how the chain of events leads to Karbala. We don't only have the problem of Hawa'un Nafs during the time. We have another problem as well. What is the other problem? The other problem is the seed of Nifaq in hypocrisy that was spoken of during the time of the Holy Prophet is continuing over the course of the 25 years. Which nifaq? Remember, the nifaq of the kuffar, the a'immatul kufr, Abu Sufyan, and the Umayyads. The Umayyads had accepted Islam based on force. They were somewhat forced into that. They saw no choice for themselves. That's why they accepted Islam. During the time of the Khulafa, the problem of Nifaq becomes a more serious problem, that same Nifaq that was there. How did they work? We mentioned that during the time of the Holy Prophet, these individuals, these people, were pretty silent. They just worked with whatever the Holy Prophet gave them. They acted like there's no problem. They didn't give the Holy Prophet any other problems. After the Holy Prophet, as we mentioned, they weren't part of the event of Saqifah. They didn't cause Saqif to, to occur. They weren't the reason why the people pledged allegiance with Abu Bakr. They weren't at least the main reason. 
They were pretty, some pretty peaceful. But what happened, the problem was, they were hiding their identity of kufr. Recite a salawat for the ulama of Muslimin. They hid their identity. Their kufr was there. They never changed that. But people didn't see that kufr that was with, within them. They gradually started getting important positions within the Muslim government. The first position that the Umayyads got, major one, was Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, the older brother of Muawiyah. The older brother of Muawiyah is the first one who is the governor of Sham. In fact, he's actually part of the army, one of the commanders of the army of the Muslims that go and conquer Sham. After they conquer it, the others go to other regions. Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan, the older brother of Muawiyah, is set as the governor of Sham. This is where it begins. But again, up to this point, there's nothing seen. It seems everything is fine. Prayers are fine. Hajj is fine. Zakat is fine. Amr bil ma'roof is fine. Nothing, nothing is, is wrong at this point yet. Then gradually, this problem starts to become a bigger problem they start to gain a little more influence. Well, one thing is the amount of time that Yazid ibn Abu Sufyan spends in that region and he is trusted. This is at the time of Abu Bakr that they conquer that region. Abu Bakr, his Khilafah for about two years. After Abu Bakr, the second Khalifa, Umar, has government for about 10 years. Throughout the time, again, it is Yazid who is governing that region. So he's able to have a firm control of that region. After Yazid, they hand over the government of Sham to Muawiyah. So the line of the, the Nifaq, the Munafiqeen, continues to control that part of the Muslim world. But then something happens that makes everything a lot worse. And that is, when the second Khalifa is about to leave this world, he calls in who he considers to be the most influential and important people out of the Muhajireen. And they are Amir al Mu'mineen, Zubair, Talha. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, and Uthman ibn Affan. Out of this group, Uthman is an Umayyad. Okay. Uthman was someone who accepted Islam early on during the time of the Prophet. He wasn't one of the ones that was forced into it like some of the others were. But th nevertheless, he had a strong connection with his family. It's a long story of how within this shura that the second khalifa set up for the next khalifa, they ended up pledging allegiance with Uthman and setting him as the khalifa. It's a long story, I don't want to get into that. The fact is he became the khalifa. When he became the khalifa, this kuf started to come out and show itself and reveal itself a little more. They say there's a setting, this is recorded in history, a session where it was only the Umayyads. Abu Sufyan was waited a very, very long time. A few years during the time of the Holy Prophet, during the time of the first Khalifa, second Khalifa, he's waited all this time. He hasn't revealed what's really in his heart publicly. He's blind now. In the meeting he asked, is there anyone other than the Umayyads sitting? And they say no. He said, I swear by the one that Abu Sufyan swears by. It doesn't say I swear by God. I swear by the one that Abu Sufyan swears by. There is no resurrection. There is no hereafter. All of that is, in my words, trying to explain what he meant. All of that is baloney. 
There's no truth to it. He says, play around with this. It's like a ball. Kick it around amongst yourselves. Okay. In other words, this authority is something that you guys are going to be passing on to one another. Don't allow it to go to the other team. You know, when you're playing football, you want to make sure you have control over the ball. Okay. Abu Safyan uses the same terminology then. He says, make sure you keep control of this ball. It's a game. It's about power. Now they say in history, they say Uthman gets upset and tells him to get up and leave. But anyone who reads that, even in history, those who come to know about this, like, wait a second, if I would have heard that, instead of just telling him to leave, something more than that should have happened. Some have said, I don't know why he allowed him to live after that. But anyway, this is, again, the beginning of it. What Uthman does, he starts to gather the Umayyads and give them key positions. One of the first things he does is Hakam, who is an Umayyad, that the Holy Prophet had sent to exile to Ta'if because he made, even after he became Muslim, he was forced into accepting Islam upon the conquest of Mecca. But even after he supposedly became Muslim, he still didn't give up his kufr. He would mock the Holy Prophet. He would say wrong things. The Holy Prophet cursed him once he was mocking the Holy Prophet and his face remained in the shape that he was mocking the Holy Prophet for the rest of his life. And then he exiled him, sent him to exile him to Ta'if. He said, I don't want to see this guy anymore. As soon as Uthman came to power, he called him back into Medina. The son of Hakam, Marwan, who becomes later on one of the dirtiest Khulafa, or if we even can call them at that point Khulafa, they become kings and monarchs. He gives them a lot, he gives them key positions, all of the Umayyads. Kufa is given to an Umayyad, Muawiyah is already taking care of Sham. Egypt is given to one of the Umayyads as well. And beyond just giving key positions, then they start revealing themselves more and more and more. Their practices, they start bringing Christians and Jews and non-Muslims close to themselves. They don't really believe in Islam. They start drinking, sometimes even to an extent publicly. They start distributing wealth unjustly. Power is distributed unjustly against the will of the Holy Prophet. So you see this kuf, this line of nifaq and kufr, which is, as I said, there's two definitions of nifaq. One of them is weakness and faith. We don't want to deal with that. The more difficult one to deal with is real kufr, that is portrayed as Islam, those are the real dangerous guys. During this time, this line of nifaq strengthens. They start gaining power. They start controlling key positions within the Islamic empire. This is very dangerous. The other thing that happens, the enemies, again looking at the enemies during this time, that first enemy that we talked about, Hawa'un Nafs, that starts becoming a stronger enemy as well. How is that? The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spent his time not just expanding the Muslim empire, not just expanding the jurisdiction that he had authority over and bringing more and more people into Islam just to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah He also worked a lot to try to train these individuals to become strong believers, real believers people who believe in the hereafter people who would give up everything in this world for the hereafter. 
This is the verses of the Holy Quran always tell us there's a constant repetition. You know, they say out of the aqa'id that we have, out of the beliefs that we have, the one which is repeated most in the verses of the Holy Quran is ma'ad. Judgment. The hereafter. You know why? Because that is what motivates people to do the right thing and avoid wrong. If you stop remembering that, if you start forgetting that, even if you believe in God, it's not too important to commit sins anymore, to do what's wrong. Because you're not afraid of this God that you believe in. You need to have that fear. The Holy Prophet tried very hard. Amir al-Mu'mineen in one of the khutbas in Nahj al when he wants to describe the believers during the time of the Holy Prophet, after he becomes, becomes the Khalifa, the five years, it says in Masjid of Kufa, after the Fajr prayer, Amir al-Mu'mineen turns around and starts addressing the people. He starts addressing them and describing to them believers. He said, during the time of the Prophet, there were believers that would stand up in prayer in the middle of the night when everyone else is asleep. And they would stand in prayer so long that they were, their feet would get tired. You know, when you're standing, if you stand for too long, if you get tired and you can't sit, you start leaning on one. And then when that one gets tired, you start leaning on the other one. And you go back and forth. Amir al-Mu'mineen says this is how they were. This is how long. They would recite long surahs in their night prayers. Long du'as. The verses of the Holy Quran tell us, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, qum al-layl illa qalila. I wish I would be practicing this. Keep the night awake, most of it. Sleep only a little amount of it. These are the verses of the Holy Quran. They would do that. They would spend a long time in their night prayers. In their qiyam, their standing. In their ruku, in their sujood. He describes that. And he says these people with all that worship that they did, when they would wake up in the middle of the night, they would shiver out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how the Holy Prophet trained these individuals. So the Holy Prophet trained them and trained these individuals to be God-fearing. What happened during the 25 years, brothers and sisters, is because of the injustices on one hand, when the just ruler is not the leader, injustice is bound to happen. The injustices, they started giving privileges to certain individuals. The same companions of the Holy Prophet started receiving privileges. They started getting more of the khiraj. Now, when you start getting more, when you start receiving privileges, and this is something for you and I, brothers and sisters, when they unjustly take a privilege away, we're all over the place. Shouting our lungs out. But when they give us a privilege unjustly, we don't mind it. Okay. That's a problem. This is what happened. They started liking it. They first started distinguishing between Arab and non-Arab, second Khalifa. They gave Arabs more. If they were Quraysh, a more well-known Arab tribe, they would receive more as compared to the non-Arabs. During the time of the Uthman, it got even worse. And some of the companions of the Holy Prophet got filthy, filthy rich. Now their motives, their intentions start moving away from being the hereafter. Now they're more worried about this dunya. 
Hawa'un nafs. When the nafs starts receiving what it desires more and more and more, then the desires of the human being start taking control. This is a second problem that happens during the time of the Khulafa, which we will see how these two play an important role in what happens during the five years of Amir al Mu'mineen and then the time the government of Imam al Mujtaba. These are very, very important things that happened during that time, which will inshallah will continue tomorrow night. Sallallahu alaykum ya ahla bayt al nubuwah. Sallallahu alaykum Ya ahla bayt Some blessings be upon you, my beloved Holy Prophet, and the Ahlul Bayt. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. It was in your homes that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Blessed us with guidance and revelation. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. Upon you descend angels day in and day out. Seeking permission before entering upon you. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayka ya Mazlum. Sallallahu alayk Ayyuha al-shaheed Bikarbala Atshana May Allah's peace and blessings Be upon you My beloved Imam al-Husayn May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you, my beloved oppressed Imam, the Imam that was slaughtered by the shores of the Euphrates while his mouth was dry of a thirst. Sallallahu alayhi Ya Madhloom, Ya Aba Abdullah It is not a custom to remember the lady Zainab during the first ten nights of Muharram but we've received a request to remember Aqilatu Bani Hashem Sallallahu alayki Ya Umm 
المصائب May Allah peace and blessings be upon you O mother of all calamities Do you want to know why the lady Zainab is referred to as Ummul Masaib? Because when she was only a child, she had to see before her eyes Amir al Mu'minin being carried to the masjid. She had to watch with her own eyes her mother covering her face from Amir al She had to witness Amir al washing the body of the lady Fatima to Zahra in the middle of the ghusl, standing against the wall, crying loudly, Fatima, you did not tell me. Of your wounded shoulder Imagine a little girl watching this Imagine her missing her mother Because the lady Zainab in Kufa Later on, years later, she's at home. Amir al Mu'minin is carried home from the masjid. I don't want to picture too much how Amir al Mu'minin is looking like. All I can say is that they have reported that he was not able to walk himself. They carried him. They say Amir al Mu'minin, when he got close to home, he told his companions, I want you to put me down and help me walk. They said, Ya Ali, why is that? He said, I don't want Zainab to see me in this state. Imagine Zainab in the room watching her father fainting every now and then. The reason is back in Medina one day they came to Zainab and said, you better hurry. Your brother Imam Al-Hassan has called upon you. They say when she entered the room, the lady Zainab is watching Imam Al-Mujtaba coughing up blood due to the poison that he's given. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, all of that is not even comparable to what she saw in Karbala. صلى الله عليك يا قيلة بني هاشم Was it sufficient in Karbala that she heard the call of Ali al-Akbar when he announced يا أبتا ذا جدي يقرئك السلام they say when Ali and Al-Akbar called his father, at this point Zainab ran to join Imam al Hassan. She witnessed the body of Ali ibn al Hassan. 
Was it sufficient to know that Qasim has gone to the battlefield? Was it sufficient to see Abdullah ibn al-Hasan went to the battlefield? None of this is comparable to the moment that she heard the sound of the horse of Imam al-Hasan. She came out hoping to see her brother. But she saw the janah without a rider. She started at calling Wa Muhammad Wa Ali Have I lost my brother yet? She ran to find some elevation to see what is happening. She found what is called today Talluz Zainabiyya. When she went above it, all she had to do was look in that direction to see what Shimru Jalisun Imagine Zainab seeing that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Umm al ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون